And I would like to go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 2. I know we left off from there on Friday, I believe it was. So we're going to go back to that. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 2. All right. We're happy to see everyone out tonight, and I want to say that the choir did a fantastic job. I was so proud. I felt like crying. I was so proud. You all sung with so much anointing, very heavily anointed, uh, and did such a fantastic job, and, and we appreciate that. I think it was very remarkable for not having sang in three months. Uh, but the way that you all sang uh, shows that you've been through something. A lot of us around here have been through something. Is that right? <laughs> and when you've been through something and you're singing, it adds something to your singing. Because you sing with conviction. Uh, you sing with uh, sing with um, power because you're singing what you really believe in and what you really know uh, to be true. And you're singing what God means to you. And of course, he has to mean those things to you because through the fire and the trials that you've gone through or going through, um, you are persevering. Uh, a lot of people are not persevering. A lot of people are falling by the wayside. So the Lord is, is really working through you all uh, in, your, in your lives, even when you're not here, holding on in spite of what you're going through, what you're encountering. And that's a blessing. That's a blessing. It shows that uh, there is some serious spiritual growth that's going on within you. Now, you might not think too much of it, but I can see it. And it shows uh, your singing. So we thank the Lord uh, for that. We rejoice in that fact uh, of what God is doing uh, through you. So we say amen. Amen. So First uh, Peter chapter 1, verse number 2. Um, and I appreciate everyone that went to support. Uh, Mother Darlene went to support. Mother Darlene loves going out of town. Uh, and uh, we thank the Lord for her going and supporting and uh, others. I think Sister Brown, you went, right, did you? Did you go? Okay, she wasn't able to make it, but others that went, we appreciate uh, the support. First Peter chapter 1 and verse number 2. All right, let's read this verse. Um, let's read, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Now, um, we already dealt with this to some extent uh, on Friday, and just to revisit it here as we springboard from this, um, Paul, or Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. It is through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, we want to talk about that. Uh, we already dealt with that elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Um, that election of God is through the sanctification of the Spirit that enables us to be obedient. Thank you. Enables us to be obedient. And the election is part of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And he says, grace unto you and peace be what? Multiply. Now God's election which is again those that he foreknew beforehand that will make the rapture, that will meet up to his requirements of his election. 
The only way we're going to meet God's requirements or the only way we can meet God's requirements, which is holiness, is through the sanctification of the Spirit or the Holy Ghost. It is only through the sanctification of God's Spirit as God's Spirit sanctifies us, purifies us, or should we say sanctifying us, meaning enabling us to be obedient and to walk in the Spirit. This is what will put us in his election. This is what will do it. God already knows who's going to make it, and we don't. But by us allowing the Spirit of God to sanctify us, that is to set us apart from sin and it is through that process as we go through the trials and the tests and the temptations and not giving in to them, keeping ourselves holy, purging ourselves, keeping ourselves unspotted from the world. This is God's process that he is bringing us through his purging process, his process of sanctification so that in the end we will be in that election. That's why Peter says, and he understood God's election. That's why he refers to uh, the church elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. It is through the sanctification of the Spirit. That's why the Holy Ghost is necessary. It's necessary for a person to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost because you can't have sanctification without the Holy Ghost. You can't have holiness without the Holy Ghost. Now you can have personal righteousness but as we know, Isaiah said, all of our righteousses are as what? Filthy rags in the sight of God. Our righteousness is not good enough to get us into heaven. It's his righteousness. And we obtain his righteousness through the sanctification of the spirit of God that enables us, gives us the power and the ability to meet God's requirements. And God's requirements is simply to live holy to be obedient, to walk in the spirit. If we walk in the spirit, and that term walk simply means to be influenced, inspired by the spirit, to allow the Holy Ghost to influence how we live, how we act, how we behave, how we respond, how we think. If we allow the Holy Ghost to dictate how we live, regardless of our situations or our circumstances or what we encounter, that is what will put us in his election. Now, of course, he already knows who the elect are, but we don't. And so since we don't, by faith we are to believe that we are in that election, and we are to believe that we are in that election by making our calling and election what? Sure, and how do we do that? By being obedient to his word as the Holy Ghost enables us to do that. You follow, can we say amen? See, we are never helpless. When trials and difficulties come, we are not slaves to sin anymore. We used to be. But sometimes your flesh, your flesh will try to make you think that you are powerless against the forces that come against you, against the temptation, against the urges, against the pleasures of sin. But that's a lie. And that's why you have to resist the devil and resist your flesh. And he will what? Flee. Have to allow what God is trying to do. God is trying to save us. He's trying to get us in. He's trying to get us ready. All we have to do is surrender to his will no matter what it is, no matter what it will cost us to do away with our will and what we want to do in our pleasures and learn how to please God. That's the process of sanctification. It is through the sanctification of the Spirit. The Holy Ghost sanctifies us if we allow it to. It will lead us and guide us into some truth. What? All truth. The 
Holy Ghost is designed to keep us from sin if we allow it to, if we allow it to work. It will enable us to meet God's requirements. Now, I want to make this point that being the elect of God is accomplished by the baptism of the Holy Ghost that is in us. It enables us again to meet God's requirements as long as we allow it to work in our behalf. All right, now um, we want to move on to where he says, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Being in God's election is only accomplished through the sanctifica sanctification of the Spirit and it was only accomplished through the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> because if Jesus had not shed his blood, the Bible says in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no what? Remission of sins. So Peter is letting us know how we have become the elect according to the foreknowledge of God. It, was, it is to be done through the process of sanctification of the Spirit and by the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because if it wasn't for his blood that was shed, nobody would have been able to meet God's requirements. No one would have been able to meet God's requirements because there would be no salvation. There would be no baptism of the Holy Ghost. There would be no Spirit of God to enable a person to meet God's requirements. If it had not been for the blood shed of Jesus, there would be no election. So if we are the elect of God, it's because we were elected in his foreknowledge. Now, the election is not individuals. God did not choose individuals. When John Calvin said that God chooses individuals to be saved or lost, he elected some individuals. He elected, uh, did not elect others. The election, the predestination is always in the plural. What God has elected was his church, his church. And it is those that he already knows that will meet his requirements. Those that will be obedient. Those that will allow the Spirit of God to dominate their lives. Can we say amen? All right, well, the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus, the cleansing power, the saving power of Jesus Christ is what allowed us the opportunity to be in God's election. <clears throat> That's why I can't st stop singing and rejoicing about being saved. That's why I still remember my salvation experience 35 years ago. Can we say amen? Because that was the day that God saved me and gave me an opportunity to be one of his elect. Now all I gotta do is make it sure. Now of course I know some of you all deal with a lot of people online that's supposed to be saved. <clears throat> and the most frustrating thing <clears throat> is dealing with people on Facebook or online that are supposed to be saved tending to be sane and acting and behaving in manners that does not foster holiness. But what we've got to understand is that they might have the salvation experience, but everybody is not going to be in God's election because everybody is not going to allow the Spirit of God to sanctify them, to separate them from the world, to separate them from sin. The only ones that will allow the Holy Ghost to work in them are those that will be in his election. And as you can see online and in Facebook and in dealing with church folk, you see that is a very 
few number. When Jesus says straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth to life and few, he meant exactly that. There's just not going to be very many people saved in these times. But those that are in God's election that he foreknew that he saw make it, he saw them make it because he saw them allowing the Holy Ghost to sanctify them. And because of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus, they had that opportunity to allow the Holy Ghost to work in them. And they walk in the spirit. And when the rapture time comes, he will make us accepted in his beloved and we will be caught up. Not a whole lot of us, just a few. Can we say amen? amen? All right. Now, um, that's what Peter is dealing with. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience. The Spirit of God enables us to obey God, to keep his commandments. And to the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ is how it was all done. Now, let's go to 2 Thessalonians. Let's get Paul's explanation of it. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. Verse 13 through 17. See, Peter and Paul understood God's election. The sanctification of the Spirit is the Holy Ghost working in us right now. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13 through 17. <coughs> All right, let's read. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, this is what Paul, the Apostle Paul, saying to the saints in Thessalonica, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Why? Oh, for you, brethren, beloved of who? Of the Lord. Is everybody there? Let's read. Because God hath from the what? Beginning chosen you to what? Salvation. How? Through sanctification of the Spirit and what? belief of the truth. He did it from the beginning. And I even take it a little further than that. He did it before the foundation of the world. From the beginning. Chosen you. Now as we said, he did not choose individuals. The choosing of God, the election of God is always in the plural. The predestination of God is always in the plural. And that's why you should be able to understand more clearly what Paul said to the saints in Romans chapter 8. When he says, those whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed into what? Image of his son. That's the process of sanctification through the spirit that puts us in his election. Because it is through that process that enables us to be able to have the power to live free from sin. Amen. See, when people talk about you can't live free from sin, they're saying you can't be saved. Because live, living free from sin has to do with the Spirit of God sanctifying us. That enables us to meet the standards of his election. And what is the standard of God's election? It's holiness. Because holiness is all that God is. All that he is. Holiness. Well, Paul says, we're bound to give thanks unto God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the truth. If we're going to be saved, it's going to be through the sanctification of his spirit and belief of the truth. We're going to have to be sanctified by the Holy Ghost. We're going to have to believe the truth. If we do those two things, we are in his election. And he already foreknew that we would be in it. Can we say amen? See this, the election and foreknowledge of God, what it shows us is the importance of living holy. 
the importance of living free from sin. And it also shows that those that refuse to live right, it is a clear sign that they are none of his. Yes, they have been baptized in Jesus' name. Yes, they have been filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes, some of them are preachers. Yes, some of them sing in the choir. Yes, some of them are deacons. Yes, some of them pay tithes, give offering, but not in the election. Because in the end, they never met God's requirements. And he saw that they wouldn't meet it, and their names are not in the Lamb's Book of Life. Isn't that something? Well, the sanctification belief of the truth, verse 14. Whereunto he called you by what? Our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you what? Have been taught, whether by word or what? Our apostle. Hold to what you've been taught. Can we say amen? amen. Let's read. Uh, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God. And that and comes from the Greek K-A-I, which means even. So it says, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself, even God. Let's read. Even who? Our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us what? Everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. How is it that God can do that? Because we are his election. How is it that we are demonstrating we're his, we're his election? Because we're allowing the Holy Ghost to sanctify us because we are living holy and we believe the truth and we are holding to the traditions that we have been taught. Everybody's not holding to the teaching. Everybody's not living holy. Some folk are making excuses. Well, I'm perfect, but I'm not forgiven. You're neither perfect nor are you forgiven. Can we say amen? Amen. And why do we have to pick up all these slogans? Why don't we pick up these slogans? Be ye holy, for I am what? Holy. Why can't we pick that up? Why can't we pick up follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall what? See the Lord. Your Hebrews 12, 14. And, that, and of course, no man shall see the Lord. They're not going to see his face in peace. You know why? Because if they're not living holy, then can't be in the election. They can't be in it. Yeah, they got saved. But they did not get sanctified through the Spirit. They didn't believe the truth. They did not endure unto the end. Can we say amen? So it is the Spirit of God that sanctifies us, if we allow it to. The sanctification of the Spirit is the Holy Ghost working in us, both to will and to do his good pleasure. And do you know what that good pleasure is? Being holy. There is no other pleasure of God that we can give him other than holiness. And we can't give him that unless the spirit is working in us. <coughs> can we say amen? amen? Titus chapter 1, verse number 1. I'm still battling this cough. I just don't want to leave. Just hanging on. Titus chapter 1, verse number 1. All right. Well, we skipped over Philippians 2.13. I think that says, um, yes. Philippians 2.13, I quoted it. You can write the scripture down. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's Philippians 2.13. We were supposed to read it, but I quoted it. All right. Titus chapter 1, verse number 1. Let's read. Paul, a servant of God and what? Apostle. Notice he didn't put, he didn't put apostle first, then servant. He put what? Servant and what? It's, we are so caught up in titles. 
Somebody said, you got to have money to become a bishop. <laughs> you got to have money. <laughs> you got to have money. If you want to be a bishop, you got to have money. I ain't got to have no money to be no bishop. Because I ain't got to be, I'm already a bishop. Bishop is one of the 18 titles of a pastor. And I don't care if anybody call me bishop. You know, just let me be in the election. Because we got some that are bishops that are not going to be what? <laughs> That's just a fact. All right. Paul, a servant of God and what? An apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is what? He's notice how that goes together. The faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after what? Godliness. The truth has godliness in it, God-likeness, because Jesus is the truth. He said, I am the way and the what? Truth and the life. Now, we want to talk about the faith of God's elect. The faith of God's elect. The faith of those that will be in the election. The faith of those that God saw before the foundation of the world meet his standards of his election when he made his choice. Their faith, the faith of God's elect, is that victory that overcomes the world. Well, let's go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 through 4, to show you that. The faith of God's elect. What type of faith is that? What type of faith is the faith of God's elect? 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. <laughs> the faith of God's elect is the victory that overcomes the world. 1 John 5, verse 3, let's read. For this is the love of God that we what? Keep his commandments and his commandments what? <coughs> Those that have the faith of God's elect do not look at God's commandments as grievous, as a burden, or as some people say, legalistic, or as judging, or as your opinion. The faith of God's elect, they don't look at his commandments that way. Those that are not going to be in the election do. <laughs> Those that are baptized in Jesus' name for the Holy Ghost that are not going to be in the election may look at his commandments and not grievous, but the faith of those that are going to make it, whose names are in the book of life, do not look at his commandments as grievous. You know why? Because they love God. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my what? Commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. So if I don't keep his commandments, then I don't love God. Not according to this. Oh, I love God. And they're just doing any and everything that they're big enough to do. No, you don't. You don't love God. God said you don't love him if you don't keep his commandments. No matter what you say, no matter what I say, I can sit up there and say I love God all day long, but if I don't keep his commandments, I don't love him. And I cannot be in the election or I may not even be in the election. Maybe that's why I'm walking around saying that I love God and doing any and everything I want to do. See, some folk are just not going to be in the rapture that are in the church. Can we say amen? amen. It's just not going to happen. And that's a very shocking thing. Remember, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. I remember Bishop David Ellis asked Bishop Paddock a question during the 1988 doctrinal conference down in Indianapolis, Indiana. And the question that he had, because it was between Bishop Paddock and Bishop Brazier, Bishop, the late Bishop Brazier was teaching once saved, always saved. He believed in some of the five points of Calvinism. <clears throat> and he was teaching that God has chosen some to be saved and some to be lost. 
And Bishop Paddock explained predestination like this. Predesti the individuals are not predestinated. The destinies are predetermined. Now, you can go to the airport. In the airport, they have hundreds of flights. And the flights are going to different places. Is that right? But you choose which flight you get on based upon what destination you want to arrive at. See, one of the five points of Calvinism is that we don't make the choice. We don't have free choice. God chooses who gets saved. God chooses who's going to be lost. They say we don't have a choice in the matter. But the Bible disagrees with them because the scripture says, whosoever will, let him what? Come. You see, Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor, heavy laden, and I will what? Give you rest. So it's like the airport. There's hundreds of flights that take off in the airport every day. We decide which plane we want to get on. Whatever plane we get on, the destination is set. You can't get on a plane that's destined, that's destined to go to Chicago and you want to go to California. You got to get on the plane that's going to where? California. That's how predestination works. There's two gates. Straight is the gate. Narrow is the way that leads to life. There's another gate. Broad is the gate. Wide is the way that leads to destruction. But we choose which gate we're going to go through. Just like in the airport. You choose which gate you're going to go through to get on which plane to go to a various destination that you want to get to. That's how it works. Well, and the, the thing that determines where we go is whether or not we allow the sanctification process of the Spirit of God to work in us both to will and to do his good pleasure, which is to live holy, that will determine what destination we go, where we go. You follow? So, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Verse 4, for whatsoever is born of God does what? Overcometh. T.H. continues to overcome the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. What is it? Our faith. If we are going to overcome the world, it's going to be by our faith. Our faith and our love for God. It is the faith in his people that will cause them to love God even unto death. Can we say amen? amen? The love for God will cause us to be faithful unto death to him. To love truth. To allow <coughs> the Holy Ghost to work in us to walk in the spirit see we are fighting to get into the election fighting our flesh telling our flesh no crucifying our flesh mortifying the deeds of our body there's two things we got to do to be saved we have to put off and put on put off sin put on the garments of holiness <coughs> and we'll look at those things as we go along all right, let's go to, um, well, we want, let's read Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Let's read that. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. We're going to try to get through this tonight because we've been in this subject for a little while. Chapter 2, verse 10. All right, let's read. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation, what? Ten days. Now, I believe this is to the church uh, in Smyrna, the church age in Smyrna, which was... Um, the church period of A.D. 100 to 300 after the apostles had died. And 
It was during this time they had tribulation 10 days. Those 10 days has to do with the 10 periods of inquisition that the saints went through back between AD 100 when the last apostle died to AD 300. And the message that God gave for them in that day, he says, some of you will be cast into prison that you may be tried. You shall have tribulation 10 days, but this is what we want. Be thou faithful, what? Unto death, and I will, what? Give thee a crown of life. The faith of God's elect is the kind of faith that produces within the child of God a love for God and a faithfulness to God even unto death. Even unto death. Those are the ones that God saw making. He said in Jude, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying the Holy Ghost. You know what that most holy faith is? What is our most holy faith? It's holiness. Holiness. You don't hear much teaching about holiness anymore. You don't hear preachers dealing with holiness too much anymore. But it is all that God is. And that's what his spirit is designed to produce in us if we surrender to it and live for him in every facet of our lives. Even allow the Holy Ghost to dictate to us how we think, what we say, where we go, what we look at, what we lend our ears to. In spite of the pleasures of the flesh, to deny ourselves, take up his cross, take up our cross, and do what? Follow him. Follow him in the regeneration. Follow him in this saved life until the time comes we can get out of here. All right? Now, let's talk about Israel now. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. Excuse me, Isaiah 45 and verse number four. Now Israel's God's elect. Isaiah 45 and verse number four. Isaiah 45 and four. All right, if we have it, let's read. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast what? Yes. Know me. Their surname was Israel, because God changed Jacob's name to what? Israel. Now, when we consider God's election, we must consider it from two standpoints. And the two standpoints we must consider it from is Israel and the church. Now Israel, and there's a difference in the election of Israel and the church. Israel is God's elect in a secondary position because they lost their first position when they denied Jesus. And the church is God's election in the first position. Because when Israel rejected Jesus as a nation and they were blinded, they lost the opportunity to become the heavenly seed. The first became last and the last what? Okay, first, that has to do with Israel and the church. <coughs> And so Israel is God's elect in a secondary position that will be part of the earthly seed. And of course, Israel will have to go through their process of purging also, but it will be done during the tribulation period. You follow? And so the church is God's elect in the first position. And just as some of Israel we're in the election and some will not be. Likewise, the church 
Some will be in God's election or make the rapture, and some will not be. Now, let's look at Israel first. Let's go to Romans uh, chapter 1, or chapter 11, I'm sorry. Romans chapter 11, and I have here verses 1 through 32, but I don't know if we're going to read all of that. We're looking at God's elections from two points now, Israel and the church. And we're going to deal with Israel first. <clears throat> well, it looks like we're dealing with almost the entire chapter. All right. Some of Israel is in the election and some are not. Romans 11 verse 1. Let's read. <clears throat> I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, Paul says, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the what? Now, God's church today is almost an entirely Gentile church. It's only a few Jews saved. The fact of the matter is, uh, Bishop Paddock told us on one occasion, it was only through three Jews that he knew of that were saved. Or three or four. One of them was Bishop Harry Barnett, who was the former diocesan over Michigan, who uh, pastored the church in Niles, Michigan, which is the church where our council chairman, Suffering Bishop Carlton Burrell, pastors. But God has not cast away his people. They're just blinded right now, put on the shelf. And you have these so-called Bible prophecy scholars on television, John Hagee, some of these other folk, talking about if you want to see what God is doing, look at Israel. Oh, no. If you want to see what God's doing, look at the church. But because they're not part of the church, he doesn't know that. Because <laughs> they're not saved. They're not part of God's church. Well, no, he's not cast them off because Paul said, I'm saved. Let's read on. Verse 2. God hath not cast away his people, which he what? Foreknew. So there are those that are Israelites that God foreknew that are part of his election also. All right. What ye not, or what, what means think ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God a against Israel saying <coughs> Lord they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars and I am left alone and they seek my life remember when he was running from Jezebel he thought he was the only one saved <laughs> alright this is what he's talking about verse 4 but what saith the answer of God unto him I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal even so, hold it right there. That was a type. Even so. See, this is typology. Two key words in the teachings of typology. Likewise and even so. And when we deal with typology, we haven't taught on typology in years. So we're going to have to go visit that. There's a whole, Lord have mercy. I can, if I deal with all the typology information I have in detail, we'd be in Bible class for a whole year. But we ain't got a whole year. But I have a little more time. Can you say amen? Because I'm retiring Tuesday. Praise the Lord. But even so, then at this present time, let's read, also there is a remnant according to the election of what? Grace. According to God's election concerning Israel, there is a remnant. And we know what a remnant is. A remnant is a small piece of the whole bolt of cloth. Just a remnant. There is a remnant now, according to the election of grace. What is he saying? What he is saying is that there is a remnant because God foreknows who the remnant of his election concerning Israel is because he already knows who's going to make it out of Israel. And it's only going to be a remnant. All right, let's read. Verse 6. And if by grace, how are they part of his election? It is by grace. Because he came unto his own and they rejected him, but he's given them another opportunity during the what? Tribulation period. So how can one of our bishops sit up there and teach there ain't no tribulation period? He don't even know the Bible. He needs to be taught the six principles all over again. There has to be a tribulation. Because God has a remnant of election that is going to make it and is going to be by his what? 
grace. <coughs> All right, let's read. Uh, and if by grace, then it is, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is what? It's not going to be by them keeping the law. It's going to be by God's mercy or by his grace. Him rewarding them what they really did not deserve. And that is an opportunity to be in his election. All right? <clears throat> and we're going to look at how they're going to get in. <clears throat> Let's read on. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election have obtained it, and the rest what? Were blinded. And those that were blinded were those that rejected Jesus. So all of Israel has not gotten it. Every single Israelite has not gotten it, but the election have obtained it, and the rest were what? Blinded. Let's read on. Verse 8. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber. That's in Isaiah chapter 29. Spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear. Remember, Jesus said, well hath Isaiah spoken of you, because you have eyes that you can't see, you have an understanding that you can't perceive, you have ears that you can't hear. Jesus told them that when he was here. Isaiah prophesied about it. And he quotes it here. All right. Um, even unto this day. Verse number nine. And David saith, let their table be made a snare, a trap, and a snare and a trap and stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for, to provoke them what? See, God had it set up for Israel to be blinded so that he could turn away from them and give us an opportunity for salvation. See, <coughs> and this was a mystery. It was hidden until the days of the apostles when Cornelius got saved and the revelation came and that God revealed it to the apostle Paul that the Gentiles were also to be included in his plan. All right. Um, verse 12. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more what? Their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles I magnify my office if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and my what? As I'm ministering to you Gentiles and salvation is coming to the Gentiles and their eyes are being opened my hope is that my brother will see this and their eyes will become open and they can be saved also through his preaching through his office of apostleship. Let's read on verse 15. 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life, what? From the dead. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are what? The branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root, and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root what? Who were the branches? Israel. Who was the wild olive tree? The Gentile. Who was the root? The root of David. What's his name? Jesus. All right. Now, verse 19. Thou will say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be what? Grafted in. In other words, Israel failed so that salvation can be extended to the non-Jews. Because remember, one of the seven promises to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 is that in you, Abraham, shall all of the families of the earth, what? Be blessed. All the families. Let's read on. Well, well, thou will say then that branch was broken off that I might be grafted in. Verse 20. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. 
And thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but what? Fear. Let's read on. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he what? Now, if just one save, always save, then how is it that the branches were broken off? And how is it that the warning concerning us is that be not high-minded because just as Israel failed, we can fail also. All right. Verse number 22. <clears throat> Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fail severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also, what? Shalt be cut off. Let's read on. And if... And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to what? Graft them in again. Of course, he will, because there is an election of the remnant according to grace. But when they get in, it will be in a secondary position. All right, let's read on. Now, what's the next verse? Verse 24. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own what? Olive tree. Now, we were that wild olive tree, and God grafted us in, uh, and it was done contrary to nature. He saved us contrary to nature. It's not natural to take a wild olive tree and graft it into uh, another tree. It's contrary to nature. So God saving us and working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure, producing holiness is contrary to nature. Because our nature is prone to sin. It's natural for us to sin. It's natural for us to lie. It's natural for us to cheat. It's natural for us to lust. It's natural for us to commit fornication. It's natural for us to be deceptive because our nature is falling. But because of what God has done, he has given us his spirit. We are partakers of his divine nature. Now our living and walking in the spirit, everything we do in living for God is contrary to what is natural for us to do? And that is what God wants us to do. Can you say amen? amen. <clears throat> now I'll tell you a testimony from this scripture. God spoke to me this scripture one time because when it came into my heart to come to Bay City, my family was against it. Not my wife. She was against it at first God, until God dealt with her heart. But my family, my mother and sisters and all of them. And they said, you going up the Bay City ain't no black folk in Bay City. Nothing but white folk. You know no black man can get no white folk to come to this church. Now me and my wife won more white people in the church in Jackson than anybody ever did at that time. So I wasn't worried about that. But you know, you keep listening to people. Can you say amen? The more folk saying it and you keep listening, pretty soon it wears on you. So I was like, well, Lord, are you really sending me up there? What kind of church am I going to have? And we found out there was only 900 black folk in Bay City out of 33,000 people. And God gave me this scripture because I said, it's only natural, because this is what my family would say, it's only natural for people of the same color to gravitate to each other. And that's true. Yeah. But then God spoke to me and he says, yes, it is true that some people of different races gravitate to each other, the Spanish, the Mexican, the blacks, the whites. But he said, but I saved you contrary to nature. And he gave me this scripture. So he said, I'm not sending you to Bay City to do that which is natural. I'm sending you to Bay City to accomplish that which is unnatural because I'm a God that does things unnaturally or as he said it, supernaturally. And after that, I was all right. You see what listening to people can do? Sometimes listening to folk, sometimes it makes sense. But it's not God sense. Can we say amen? See, there's sense and then there's God sense. 
God says. So he saved us to do that which is contrary to nature, contrary to our fallen nature. And that is to live for him. All right, well, um, let's read on here a little further. Um, verse 25, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. This is one of the 11 mysteries of God we taught on, this mystery. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of what? The Gentiles come in. Now, <coughs> that is a Bible class in and of itself, the times of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles has to do with when God is finished with the Gentiles. He will lift the judgment off of Israel during the middle of the tribulation period and allow some of them to be saved. And he will open up their eyes and they will see for the first time that Jesus was their Messiah all along. The fullness of the Gentiles or the complete work of the Gentiles will take place in the middle of the tribulation period because Israel's punishment, according to what Moses told them, that if they go into the promised land and backslide, Moses told them seven times that God will punish you seven times for your sins. And whenever God deals with Israel in judgment, their days of judgment is a year for a day. When in a Gentile prophetic period, when it deals with judgment concerning Israel, is a year for a day. Now Israel's days in their year was 360 day cycles. Ours is 365 and a quarter and we add a leap year every so often. But Israel's days of their year was 360 days in their year. Now, if God was going to punish them seven times for their sins, then you multiply 360 times seven. And if it is a year for a day, that comes out to 2,520 years, which is the times of the Gentiles. It started when they went into captivity in Babylon. <clears throat> and it will end in the middle of the tribulation period. But I want you to know, according to your Bible, 2,500 of those years have already passed. And, and so you know we are close to the rapture because the rapture is supposed to take place three and a half years before the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So you know that the rapture could take place at what? Any time. Because 2,500 of those years are already passed. And their judgment will end in the middle of the tribulation period and uh, that will end the judgment of God upon Israel and there will be a remnant according to the election of grace that will make it. All right? Well, that's not our subject, but verse 26, let's read. And so all Israel, what? shall be saved. Now that doesn't mean every single individual, but there will be Israelites saved out of all 12 tribes. Because when Jesus came the first time, he only came to two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. But there's the 10 lost tribes. And that's why he's coming in the tribulation period to extend salvation to all, the whole nation of Israel, because there is an election. It is a remnant, according to grace, that is going to make it. And you read in the seventh chapter of Revelation, it's 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. But that's not all. All right? Um, they will be part of that heavenly seed. So let's read. Uh, so, is, so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from who? Jacob. And this is when Jesus comes. His feet's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. And he's going to pour out his wrath, which is going to begin the great day of God's wrath. Verse 27, for well, this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away what? Their sins as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for what? Father's sake, because according to the election, the election is God, based on his foreknowledge, saw some of them make it, meet his requirements of his election. The requirements of election for them is different for us they're going to have to give their lives to make it. All right? 
Let's read on. For, for the gifts and calling of God are what? Without repentance. That is, God has not repented. He has not changed his mind. He is still calling them to the election. He has not changed his mind. He's going to do. Israel is still his inheritance. He is still going to save some of them. But they're going to be his election in a secondary position. All right? So when you talk about the election, you have to talk about it from two standpoints. Israel and the church. Israel in the secondary position, the church in the first position. Because when you deal with Revelation, uh, Matthew chapter 24, it mentions God's two elects that most Bible students get confused. Israel and the church. They're both spoken of in a few verses between each other and they're both called the elect. That's why many apostolics or some apostolics teach that the church is going through tribulation period because it mentions the elect in Matthew 24, but it mentions the elect twice. One elect is in the earth. The other elect is in heaven. The one elect is Israel in a secondary position. The other elect is the church in heaven. And we'll show you that. We'll get to it. All right. Well, let's, if we get through these scriptures, can we say amen? amen. All right, let's read. <coughs> Gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Verse 30. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their what? Unbelief. Do you understand it now? Verse 31. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain what? Mercy, verse 32. But God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon what? Upon all of them. So some of Israel is in the election. Let's go to St. John chapter 1, verse 11 through 13. How much time do I have? Because I know we need to rush. I thought I was going to finish this tonight, but we're not going to finish it. I'm on page two and I got another page to do and the front page of th page three and we'll be done. 17 minutes, see, the clock is beating me again. St. John chapter one, Israel is God's elect. <coughs> chapter one, verse 11 through 13. St. John chapter one, verse 11 through 13. Some are they in the election? And some will not be. All right, verse 11. He came unto his own. Now, who's the he? That's Jesus. He came unto his own. Who's his own? The Israelites, the Jews. He came unto his own, and his what? His own received him not. Verse 12. But as many as received him, as many as who? As many of his own. That received him. You see, the nominal preacher tried to use this and say, receive the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. And they quote this scripture. And this is not dealing with Gentiles. It's talking about the Jews. And he's talking about them receiving Jesus Christ as their Messiah. The nominal preacher takes this verse and tells you to receive Christ into your heart. And when you do, you are now saved. It's not even dealing with that. It's dealing with his own receiving him as, as their what? Messiah. He came to his own and his own what? Received him not, but as many of his own. Let's read. Uh, many of his own. Okay, I lost my place. As many of his own. He came to his own, own received not. But as many of his own. Where am I at? I lost my place. Verse 12. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> but as many as received him, to them gave he what? Power to become what? Sons of God. Now that word power is not the Holy Ghost power. That word power means the right, the opportunity, the privilege to become what? Sons of God. You see, the nominal preacher will tell you, receive the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, and now you become a son of God. That's not what this says. By them receiving him as their Messiah gave them the right, the opportunity, the privilege, the chance, the power to become what? Sons of God. And when did they become sons of God? On what day? Day of Pentecost. 
They're Pentecost. They didn't become sons of God once they believed. You're not saved at the time you believe. That's the start. That gives you the opportunity to become a what? That gives you the opportunity to be baptized in Jesus' name and gives you the opportunity to receive the Holy Ghost. But see, they take the scripture and use it to bypass all of that. And it's not even dealing with that at all. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Let's read. Even to them that what? Believe on his name. He's talking about the Jews now. Which were born, <coughs> not of blood, were not saved by Jesus' blood. Somebody said, I've been saved by the blood. You're not saved by the blood. The Bible says we're saved by his life, and his life is the spirit. We are saved because of the blood. If we were saved by the blood, who did he shed his blood for? Everybody, so does that mean everybody's saved? No, we're not saved by the blood. The Bible says, which were born, not of blood. We're not saved by the blood. We're saved because of the blood. Because if it wasn't for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus through the sanctification of the spirit, we would have no opportunity to be in his election. We would not be able to have the ability to measure up to the standards of his election, which is holiness, because we would not have the Holy Ghost to enable us to live holy. All right? Which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but we were born of what? Born of who? They would be born of who? God and they were born of God on the day of Pentecost which means they were born again of the water and what? Of the spirit. That's Israel. But we want to show you here that <clears throat> of course they were begotten. Once they believe on his name they were begotten. And that gave them the opportunity to be born because before a person can be born they got to be what? begotten and begetto comes from the male side so they were begotten by the word because they believed the word and the word was like impregnated them and qualified them to be born because everybody that is born was begotten but everybody that's begotten is not what? <coughs> not born. See a lot of these nominal people in nominal churches they've been begotten they heard the word they repented they were convicted, their life has changed, but because they were in a church that did not have the truth, the children had came to the birth, but there was no strength for that church to give birth because they don't have the truth. Thank God when I came for me to come to the birth, I was at a church that had the truth. I was ready and I got filled with the Holy Ghost. The scripture says the children are come to the birth, but there's no strength to bring forth because they don't have the truth. That's the nominal church. So there's a whole lot of sincere people out there, but they don't have the truth. So they've come to the birth. They've been begotten. The word has been implanted in their heart. They've been convicted. They live good lives. And some of us look at them and call them saved. <laughs> They're not born again. They have been what? Begotten. And the reason why they're able to live good lives is because he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, John said, and the wicked one toucheth him not. Who is he after? He's after the church. He's after you. You are special. Isn't that something? That the devil wants to destroy you. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on here. Um, last scripture because we don't have time and we're done with page two and um, Friday we'll move to page three. Acts chapter 13 and verse 46. So they were born again on the day of Pentecost and they became the nucleus of the church back in those days. Acts 13 chapter 13 verse 46. All right. Let's read. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn. And this was the beginning of the end of Gentiles coming, uh, of the Jews coming into the church. 
because it was through the ministry of the Apostle Paul that the Gentiles were brought in and that local churches were established through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And of course, they didn't have buildings like this, but the churches was in their houses. And then as the churches grew in their houses, because the Gentiles didn't congregate at the synagogue. See, the Jews had the synagogue. The Gentiles didn't, so they had the churches in their houses. And then as the churches grew, it became necessary to have put the churches in the houses, so then they had to have pastors. And then once they had pastors and the churches began to grow, grow then they, there was necessity of deacons. And that's why Paul gave Timothy the instruction in 1 Timothy chapter 3 about the office of a deacon because the church began to grow. See, in Acts chapter 6, the seven men that were chosen to wait on the tables, those weren't deacons. Those were waiters. Can we say amen? A lot of these Bible scholars like to call them deacons. No, they were not deacons. Because in those days, uh, the church was not established in homes. And so now, uh, after almost 2,000 years, look at the churches now. Can we say amen? You know, we're not in the storefronts anymore. We have churches and buildings. Some of us have some of the most beautiful churches. Uh, I think Bishop Combs down in Jackson, that's the most beautiful church in the Northern District Council. And I was told it's the most beautiful church in all the PAW by those that have traveled different places. Very beautiful place. Put Jackson on the map. God did it. Bishop Combs didn't do it by himself. Who did it? Because I was out there preaching on every, sun, every day on the street corner down there. God used all of us. No one man can do it by himself. And a lot of times the pastor gets more credit than he deserves. And sometimes he gets more condemnation than he deserves too. It'd be nice if there was just a balance. But no man can do it by himself. It takes the whole church and us laboring together with God. Can we say amen? amen. Well, we're going to close tonight. That's all the time we have. And we will finish this subject, Lord willing, on Friday. All right, are there any questions on the subject tonight? God's election and foreknowledge. This subject or any other subject? Well, on Friday we have one, two, three, four, five, 